Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you to SKID for, for having me here. It's, it's been a very interesting morning so far. Um, and I'm realizing my talk is going to be a little bit different in the sense that you know I know nothing about biometrics and I'm not from the cybersecurity field, but I do know quite a bit about quantum computers. So my hope with this talk is to sort of introduce you all to, you know, given that quantum is a big buzzword these days, to really understand what is happening in the field of quantum computing and how that relates to cybersecurity and uh, if and when anyone should be worried about quantum computers, say breaking RSA, so on and so forth. Uh, I will admit, normally I don't talk at uh, corporate events, I talk in scientific conferences, so hopefully I've managed to tailor this well. If you have any questions, if I go fast, please find me, let me know. I love talking about this stuff, so I'm, I'm happy to answer all the questions later. But yeah, so to start, I figured I'd give you a little bit of background, uh, just so you know who you're talking to. There's a lot of people claiming to be quantum experts these days, uh, with, without really much uh, much to back it up. Um, but this, this is mostly to introduce you to me and to show you all the various aspects of quantum research that are out there, because I happen to go through most of them in my relatively short career. Uh, so I did my undergrad, my master's in Edinburgh, where I started getting interested in this idea of quantum computing. Uh, and I did some work with this Edinburgh and Paris quantum virtual lab on a tiny bit of quantum cryptography, so that's most of where my experience comes from, and quantum machine learning, which we will not address. Uh, this is just to show you that it's done. I did some work with an experimental group in ultra-cold atoms in Singapore for a summer, so I know a little bit of how experiments work. Uh, and then I did a PhD in physics in Glasgow at the University of Strathclyde, which was, again, like very theoretical quantum physics, condensed matter physics, this kind of thing. Uh, in between that, I did an internship at a quantum startup company called Riverlane, which works specifically on something called fault-tolerant quantum computing, which is basically error correction for quantum computers. Again, a very different field from everything else that's on that list. And uh, we're getting to today, I am currently working as a researcher in another quantum startup uh, called Facecraft, which is based in Bristol and uh, in London. And they are very much just doing uh, quantum software, quantum applications type of work. So we're not actually building a quantum computer, we're just doing solutions for these people. So uh, it's a lot to take in, but I want you to see just how diverse the field is and also to understand that, you know, if I tell you something about hardware, uh, in, in quantum hardware, I'm speaking from experience and likewise for software. Um, great. So, quick outline. I like to have this because I think it preps you for expecting what's coming next. Uh, I'll start off with... I think a large bulk of the talk will be on an introduction to quantum computing, not technical whatsoever, but just so you understand what the field is and the current state of the art, as in, you know, what can we do, what can't we do? Uh, because that's basically the context in which I then want to place um, the cybersecurity part of the talk, which is the second one. I think by the time you've seen what quantum computing is and where we're at, the actual, you know, if any claims I make about the impacts on cybersecurity should make a bit more sense. Um, so I'll start off with quantum computing, the state of the art, and then go into the threats and solutions that quantum computing can offer to the field of cybersecurity, and then a tiny detail on post-quantum cryptography at the end, which I'm not an expert in, but I can tell you vaguely what's happening in the field and what, it, what is important about it. So, uh, starting off, quantum computing, just flagging that up. This is this part of the talk, probably the longest part of the talk. Um, very basic terms. Quantum computing is the processing of information using quantum systems. What are quantum systems? Well, in essence, I will explain, but you have to understand that it's not really something terribly magical. The same way that you, when you're doing processing with classical computers, you have some input, you have some output, you do something in between, uh, and that's usually transistors of PGAs type of thing. With quantum computers, you really want to have the exact same effect, which is for some input, you want some output, and you want some useful processing done between. The difference is that now there's this black box, and this black box is a bunch of quantum systems. Um, now, what makes a quantum system a quantum system, and what makes something be a quantum computer is if the processing is done via 
these things that have capabilities like entanglement, superposition. I will not explain what they are, but you have to understand that you know, when I say quantum computing, I don't just mean things that are very small. I mean that you have to be able to show that the processing you're doing is done via these very, very specific properties. You can't just pretend that you have a quantum computer if you can't show that the thing you have has these properties. So you define quantum computing based on this. Uh, so these different properties that come with quantum systems actually allow for massive speedups for some applications and some algorithms. Not all of them, and in fact, quantum computers will never replace classical computers because that's kind of not the point. Um, but they are in the way that they can use these effects that are available only to quantum computers. They can surpass anything theoretically that any classical computer, no matter how good, can do because there are physical limits to this. And one of the reasons why quantum computers are so interesting is in particular because we are aware that we're reaching the physical limits of what classical computers can do. So you know Moore's law, this sort of thing where the power of computers doubles roughly every year. That's plateauing now. Uh, there's still things that people can do, still technical innovation, but there is an actual physical limit to what you can do. The only way to go beyond that limit is via quantum systems, quantum computers. So this is partially why it's such an interesting field and why people are so uh, invested in it. Right, so one thing you will hear very often linked to the word quantum computers is this thing of quantum advantage. So to explain what that is, I'll start with, well, I, can, I don't have to build a quantum computer. Uh, I can actually simulate it. It's just the mathematical description. I can take a quantum system and I can run it basically a simulation, exact simulation of it on a classical computer. Uh, the issue is that this is very, very inefficient. So, sure, if I have some quantum systems, you'll often hear them referred to as qubits or quantum bits. Uh, for each one of these qubits, which is kind of corresponding to a one bit, you need two to the n, so an exponential number of classical bits to simulate it. Now, if you have only, you know, a couple of these, like a couple of quantum systems, sure, I can run it on my laptop. I can do a quantum computation on my laptop, no problem. But that's not particularly useful. What we're looking for is basically having uh, enough such qubits in practice in an actual quantum computer such that no classical machine can efficiently simulate this, right? So that's what we call quantum advantage in the field. If you ever hear people talking about this, this is basically what they mean. And uh, I also often like to differentiate between just quantum advantage and practical quantum advantage because you will hear headlines. For example, Google a couple of years ago in 2019 had a paper saying, oh, we've achieved quantum supremacy, quantum advantage, we can do something that classical machines can't do. And uh, the problem they were solving was absolutely contrived. It wasn't useful for anything or anyone. It was just to show that you know, a quantum machine can do something, theoretically, that you know, in practice, that classical machines could never do. Uh, but that wasn't a practical thing. Like that's, it's, it's a useless problem to solve. It was just to sort of put out the paper, show that this can be done. Still a big milestone, don't get me wrong, because before that, people weren't even sure if you could build a quantum computer that could do something useful, like at all, if it could be the classical machine. But, we haven't done anything useful yet. And this is true, we have absolutely not done anything useful yet. I want you to take this away. If anyone's claiming that a quantum computer has solved something, it's, it's unlikely to be true. Um, unlikely, uh, but as far as I know, that hasn't happened. Right, so uh, the other thing that people often ask about is uh, what's taking so long? Why, why is it that I've been hearing about quantum computers for such a long time? Like it's been 10 years, 20 years now. Uh, I think the first algorithms before people were really interested came out in like the 80s. That's when Feynman was talking about this stuff. Um, so I wanted to give you like a broad strokes idea of why, because this kind of comes down to whenever you ask anyone a question about quantum computing and what's taking so long, it's always going to be this, which is quantum systems, very volatile. Uh, you might have heard of Schrodinger's cat, right? So if you uh, measure a quantum system, you force it into some state. Uh, you know, Schrodinger's cat, while it's in the box, it's sort of both alive and dead. Once you open the box, it's one or the other. Well, what happens is that the universe is constantly measuring every quantum system ever. So it's not just you opening the box. It's like, if you have a quantum system, it's somewhere. It's in some environment, maybe it's some big machine, uh, and it's constantly interacting with that environment. It's super volatile. It's losing information to the environment all the time. So well, what you need to do in order to build a quantum computer is to isolate these systems from the environment so that you're not losing information while you're doing a computation. But 
you also need to be able to interact with them because, well, that's how you do a computation. You want to control them. You want some input, do some processing, do some output. Well, the processing bit is you accessing the quantum system. So this kind of creates a paradox, as you can imagine. So you want to isolate it, but you also want to have external access to it. And it turns out that uh, this is an extremely hard problem to solve. It's, it's, a, it's a technical problem that no one has really been able to solve properly in the last 10 or 20 years. So for what's taking so long is just that it's not obvious, and I don't think to anyone is it obvious, how you might be able to get over this roadblock, even though there are, and you will see, incremental um, sort of advances that are being made all the time. So uh, I wanted to flag up that there's two solutions to this problem, one of which is, as sort of said, just get better, like get experimentalists to build better and better machines, you know, just technological progress, that's what it is. That's a very hard problem, it takes a lot of time, as evidenced by the fact that people have been working on this for a very long time. The other one is this fault tolerance or quantum error correction, which kind of goes, OK, what if we have a lot of really bad quantum systems that are leaking stuff into the environment all the time, but we can you know, have very many of them and sort of just correct as we go, extract information from these many, many quantum systems. So this kind of requires a lot more of them, but you are allowed to maybe have some loss, some noise, something. This is also a very hard problem, which takes a lot of time. It's not, neither of these is uh, potentially easier. Maybe the quantum error correction is a little bit. But these are the only two avenues that we have to, to solve anything. Um, so I want you to understand that this is why whenever you ask someone like, oh, when is quantum computing going to be useful? You can't answer that. These are not things we can even envision a uh, solution to in, in a practical way. Uh, so this is why people usually can't tell you when quantum advantage will be achieved. Right, so now onto the quantum zoo, which is basically just my way of saying like, hey, just so you know, here's an overview of the field of what's happening. Uh, the first part is hardware. Uh, when you talk about classical computers, you usually don't discuss too much about what hardware they're on. I imagine maybe with cybersecurity you do, because there are maybe some, some notions of uh, security and leakage linked to the type of computer or the type of system that you're using. Uh, but you don't often address, you know, it's transistors, it's FPGAs. We all know what classical computers are built of. In the quantum case, because no one really has a working quantum computer, Everyone is trying slightly different things. And you'll hear that big players like IBM, like Google, who are in the rat race, who are building their own quantum computers, uh, they are using this thing called superconducting qubits for various reasons of their own volition. But there is an entire zoo of these different types of systems, uh, cold atoms, photonic, different types of photonics, ion traps, envy centers and diamonds, and, and many, many more. Uh, Without going into detail, they all have their own benefits, they all have their own downsides. And at the moment, it is completely unclear which one of these will come out on top. And that matters because they're built different, they require different components, they're more expensive, less expensive, and they each have different properties. So if anyone says quantum computer, it could be any one of these, to be honest. Uh, the next thing is applications, which is what can quantum computers be applied to. Well, I already said that, you know, they're useful for some things, and those some things of the most promising contenders, combinatorial optimization. Many industries care about this, like large-scale combinatorics, uh, quantum chemistry, the entire pharmaceuticals industry, uh, condensed matter physics, material science, so your room temperature superconductors, this kind of thing. These are all things that quantum computers have genuine promise to solve, assuming you build big enough and good enough quantum computers. And then there's quantum cryptography, which uh, people don't talk about as much these days or as often, at least in my sphere. And I think I'll be able to tell you why once we get to the cybersecurity bit. Uh, so just so you understand, this is actually one of the genuine applications of quantum computers, but it's a very hard problem. And people sort of put it aside for now until we build better hardware. So uh, one more thing, you might or might not be aware, but quantum computing is a huge billion dollar industry at the moment. So there's a big, big boom. Um, like I said, quantum is kind of a buzzword that people use to you know, get more investment in their companies these days. Um, this is a non-exhaustive list of some of the companies from uh, 2022. There's definitely more than what's on here. Uh, I'd say there's maybe not twice as many. Um, but you could, I just wanted to show you how 
broad of a spectrum there is. So everything from, you know, your banks looking for uh, combinatorics or financial uh, modeling to, you know, software that's being applied to quantum computers like fault tolerance and people coming up with uh, better applications, new algorithms. And then the QPU bit, so quantum processing units, uh, is basically just all the different companies that are building their own hardware. And that's not counting academia, by the way, because this is just the companies, and there's a ton of groups around the world who are also trying to build their own quantum computers, so it's a huge area. Um, all the way far, I think, over to the left, right? Uh, there's also like this, this part which is just people building and supplying components to build quantum computers. So it's a, it's a huge ecosystem, uh, and it's been growing exponentially in the last 10 years, I think. So... Um, Finally, getting sort of to state of the art, you know when people tell you, okay, so how many qubits do you have? What can you actually do with them? So, unfortunately, not terribly many, <laughs> given what we need. Uh, currently, people often quote IBM numbers because IBM is really ahead of the game, generally, in terms of building quantum machines. Uh, and they have a 433 qubit chip, a superconducting quantum computer. Uh, I'm not telling you this to, you know, 40, 433 might not mean much to you now, it will in the cybersecurity part. Um, but anyway, they promised to have over 1,000 qubits by the end of the year. Uh, that hasn't been announced yet, so I don't know if that's just delayed. Um, but on the other hand, a completely different company, which was just about a week ago, maybe, announced that they have now exceeded 1,000 qubits, and that's a cold atom quantum computer. So when I said, you don't know which type of hardware is going to get ahead, I mean that. It's, it's happening every single week, something new is coming out. Um, so this is some company called Atom Computing, I believe. And uh, on the error correcting side, so I sort of said, you know, you either build bigger, better machines or you do good error correction. Uh, very recently, again, just last month, this company called Riverlane that I worked at, uh, they released a decoding chip. So you can kind of take this thing, plug it into a quantum computer, and it automatically does error correction and decoding for you. It collects the data, it does all the algorithms that do the error correction. This is completely new. No one has ever seen anything like this before in the entire field. And this has come out just, just a month ago. So. I wanted to show you that, okay, it's, it's, it's a little bit iffy if we're ever going to get to a big quantum computer, but there are a lot of innovations that are happening just this month, just in the last few weeks. So who knows? Um, right, finally, we get maybe to the part where people are a little more familiar or that people want to hear about at this conference. So I've given you the context of, you know, things are hard, this is how many qubits we have, how does this then pertain to cybersecurity? Well, the first one is uh, the most basic thing that I think if you've ever heard of threats to cybersecurity from quantum computing, you will have heard of this. Uh, most security protocols are based on the fact that fa factoring large integers into their prime factors is a really, really hard problem, provably hard problem. Uh, like RSA, I won't go into details because I'm sure those who are technical minded will know it and those who aren't have probably heard of this. Um, now, in 1994, this, this lovely gentleman that, whose picture I have up here, Peter Shor, he discovered a quantum algorithm, one of the first really big quantum algorithms that can do this factoring of integers efficiently. So efficiently, in fact, that it was shown that, you know, you could really actively break RSA, assuming you have a big enough quantum computer to do that. So, you know... I'm not here to tell you that there is much else, because in my research, I really didn't find anything else. I think Shor's algorithm is primarily the main threat to cybersecurity that people know of. Not to say you couldn't have any algorithms. You, obviously, you can. Maybe someone will come up with something else. But quantum isn't magic. You know, It's unlikely that we will, given how much time we've had to try. Um, so the bright side of Shor's algorithm, and this is where putting everything in context kind of works, is that it is extremely resource demanding, quantum resource demanding, in fact. Uh, it needs a lot of error correction uh, because you need to be able to run it really smoothly. So you need something that's not going to be lossy, that's not going to be noisy. Otherwise, the thing you're doing is, is going to turn out to be useless. You can't, you, know, you can't properly factor these numbers. Uh, this is sort of a figure from a 2013 paper which gave like estimates of how many qubits you would need to be able to break RSA. And this is like 10 to the 8, 10 to the 12, so well over millions. And, you know, sure, the numbers have gotten better since. People have done a lot of work on reducing the resources needed, but you still need millions of qubits. And 
given that I've shown you that IBM has 400 and the latest development is 1,000 qubits, and this has taken a decade to get to, uh, it is very unlikely that this is a credible threat in any near future, especially because no one has been able to figure out how to scale quantum computers efficiently yet. So, okay, we have 1,000. Oh, maybe you can put 2,000 qubit quantum computers together. It's not easy. This is not a problem that someone has solved. So, sure, in theory, Shor's algorithm is a threat, but in practice, it's just impossible to implement and probably will be for at least a decade, if not two, if ever. Um, so, of all quantum algorithms, Shor's is probably the most distant in terms of what will ever be implemented. And this is kind of why people often put cybersecurity to the side when they talk about quantum computing, because they're like, okay, sure, this thing exists, but it's, it's, so unthinkable to us now that we're ever going to build something that's big enough and effective enough to actually be able to implement it that no one's really working on it now, to be honest. Uh, not no one, but very, very few. That's, that's definitely true. Um, and sure, I did kind of, I didn't want to lie to you, which is, you know, there are improvements being made all the time. There's, uh, again, something that uh, came out just a few weeks ago, which is news that some researcher in the US uh, figured out a way to reduce some of the resources needed to implement Shores. But it's a minor reduction. It's still sort of, it's so unimaginably far away that um, I don't think anyone is thinking about it terribly seriously, at least in the industry. Um, right, so other than threats, there is a notion of quantum solutions, say, to cybersecurity, or at least uh, ways in which you can use quantum computers or quantum systems to implement uh, sort of secure communication. And for this, I actually asked a friend of mine because uh, I'm, not a, I'm not an expert in this specific topic, but he actually works on this. He's in one of the companies uh, which are building this quantum internet called Connect, uh, Mehdi Namazi or Mazi. Uh, if you want to reach out to him, feel free, but I figured that I wanted to know what the actual numbers are <laughs> rather than just guessing. Um, so, the two things that quantum can offer in terms of secure communication, the first one you might have heard of is called quantum key distribution, which is essentially a protocol for secure communications uh, in order to generate encryption keys between parties, right? So, uh, the reason it's considered very interesting and promising is because it is something that is called informationally secure. Uh, now, to explain what that is, you need to understand the two sort of different types of security that you can have in broad terms uh, in communication, which is you can have computational security, which is something that, like RSA, relies on you, know, you having to solve a very, very hard problem in order to be able to break uh, encryption. Uh, so as the assumption is that whoever's attacking just doesn't have the resources to do this. Uh, informational security, on the, other, on the other hand, or information theoretic security, is where regardless of the number of, uh, of, of the resources the attacker has, how powerful their computer is, how, how fast they can do something, uh, they absolutely cannot break this, right? So it depends on the laws of physics, it's quantum mechanics. And so, uh, yes, I figure that I'd also give you an idea of what this is, although I don't want to go into technical detail. So it's in an informationally secure way, uh, and it's basically a, just sort of sending photons between people along with classical bits, and that can guarantee you security. So it's not quite like quantum computers. It can't really do processing, but it is using ideas like entanglement, superposition, all these things to ensure that if someone is trying to tamper with your channel, you will be able to detect that and you will be able to you know, protect, your, protect your data. And so I apologize for, for gluing this here, but I did ask Mehdi if I can use his words basically, uh, because uh, I think that it, he probably says it best. Um, QKD, while very interesting, is not terribly secure because even though the protocol itself is secure, the actual hardware that you're building somewhere is easily hackable. It's expensive to build. Uh, it's not very fast, which is, you know, if you're trying to scale something up into a massive industry, it's probably not what you like. And you can't really transmit information very far. It's uh, under 200 kilometers is what he said. He also gave me a paper that said, oh, China can do 1,000 kilometers, but he said it's a terrible signal. It's, it's crap, don't listen to them. So that, that's kind of what I got from it. Um, the other one is something called entanglement-based networking, very similar to QKD, but you use entanglement, so you send sort of entangled systems uh, along some, some photons. And uh, it's technically known as more secure because you can verify entanglement much more easily, easily than whatever the process is in QKD. Um, 
And it's technically assumed to be more scalable. There's a lot of problems with that, and it's actually very hard to do, but it's in principle more scalable than QKD, and it's more versatile. So instead of having like a quantum telephone, which is kind of what quantum key distribution is, it's basically more like the quantum internet, where you can do processing and send information between quantum computers. So it's a very cool thing. Um, however, entanglement is the usual thing. Quantum systems very volatile, entanglement very fragile. Uh, so current experiments are all small, and no one knows where this is going to go. Um, again, Maddie's numbers, because they have uh, a lab set up in New York City, and he's saying, okay, well, we can do, you know, really high fidelity, really good signal, uh, 34, over a 34 kilometer uh, distance, 24 seven, but scaling that up, every added percentage is just exponentially hard. And uh, no one knows, again, what is it gonna get anywhere, if, if ever. Right, so, the last thing I want to talk about is this thing called post-quantum cryptography, which, again, you might have heard of. Uh, it's basically a classical solution to a quantum problem, and I think is probably the most practical thing that I can really say in this talk, at the very end of this talk. Um, and as you may have heard, post-quantum cryptography is basically the idea that, you know, we're all worried about Shor's algorithm. We're all worried that it's going to break RSA. Uh, so, it, but really, Shor's can't really do anything about any protocol that's not based on large integer factoring. So, if there's some other hard problems that we use to make our channel secure, then Shor's is no longer an issue. Uh, so, post quantum cryptography essentially aims to develop these new protocols that are secure against quantum attack and hopefully simultaneously secure against any classical attack. That's the thing. Um, so recently, this is again very recent news, sometime in August, the uh, NIST released three standards for post-quantum secure protocols. Great, so that shows you that there is a huge step in that direction, that these things are being standardized, these things are being used all over throughout the industry. There's a fourth one that's coming very soon. Um, and honestly, it's far more likely that we're gonna have very good post-quantum cryptographic protocols in place long before anyone even gets close to Shores being uh, any sort of problem, really. Um, and so, yes, this is exactly what I said. We're more likely to get an alternative to RSA. Uh, and the main drawback, you know, all of these methods, insofar as we know, are, well, like I said, computationally secure. So they rely on not being able to solve a real, really hard problem. And of course, someone can always come up with a new algorithm or a new quantum algorithm that uh, can, in fact, break it. Um, however, as I said, quantum isn't magic. People have tried, and we understand well enough how information processing works in these systems. And it's very unlikely that we can break these new types of protocols. So um, there's a chance, but I'd say it's not something to, to worry your head about. Um, and then there is, yes, the best contenders for these uh, PQC uh, algorithms. There's lattice-based algorithms, uh, elliptic curve algorithms. I'm throwing out words in case someone is technically minded and wants to know about this, but that's pretty much it. Um, so to conclude, I guess I like to leave a summary of things on, on the screen in case someone wants to ask questions. But yeah, quantum computing, very exciting, very unpredictable. No one knows where it's going to go. It seems like every problem that we run up against is a very hard problem. Uh, luckily, there's a lot of people working on it. Um, However, it may come about one day that we find, well, you just can't get over this volatility of quantum systems. No matter what you do, you end up using more resources trying to fix the problem than the actual quantum computer will be as a, a resource to solve something or to actually do anything useful. Uh, main threat to security, Shor's algorithm, very hard to implement, probably very distant. Uh, I really, honestly, genuinely would say it's not a near-term worry, if ever a worry. And obviously, because there's post-quantum cryptography available, it's probably a great investment, uh, even if Shor's algorithm is never implemented in practice. You might as well have a new, more secure, more uh, reliable protocol to protect uh, communications. So um, I think that's pretty much it for me. Uh, I, I hope that someone found this interesting or, uh, or useful, and yeah, feel free to ask questions. Um. Um, yeah. Before I give you this small gift um, that you can uh, take to plane <laughs> to luggage, uh, there were questions, really, already. So we can uh, have one, I, I think, 
Uh, you mentioned that the post-quantum cryptography, and that probably was before you reached the BQC uh, part, is not really being worked on, but NIST is trying to standardize BQC. Don't you think people need to work even more vigorously on this topic? Yeah, maybe that's the... I think there are people working on it. I know several people who are working on it, far more than they're working on actual quantum cryptography. Uh, and yeah, maybe it's because I don't have much faith in implementing Shores that I'm not terribly worried about it. But I do think it's something that people should work on in general. I mean, one of the nice things that comes out of quantum computing research is that you end up discovering other things on the way. It's like NASA trying to build rocket ships and then figuring out you know, various innovations in the in completely different areas of life. Uh, it's the same thing with quantum. It's like, hey, work on better security. Sure, great, post-quantum crypto, fantastic. Um, yeah. But uh, there's a next one that is not crypto. This is now uh, elaboration on something totally different. Uh -huh. Elaborate how exactly will quantum computers improve medicine and, or chemistry? that you mentioned as an example. Yeah. Uh, quantum, basically, uh, when you're talking about quantum chemistry, uh, you are generally talking about effects that are on the quantum level. So things can be in superposition, things can be entangled. And like I said, simulating these things is really, really hard for each quantum system. And in an abstract sense, you need like an exponential number of classical resources to simulate it. So the way people try to understand, like do drug design or understand the kind of chemistry that happens in the industry is, uh, is by simulating these things on a computer. Because uh, sometimes the only way you can understand if something's going to have the effect that you want it to have is if you have a simulation of it, you understand the model. Turns out we're running up against uh, issues of you know, larger molecules, the ones that are actually involved in drugs, are just impossible to simulate with enough accuracy that you understand what's happening there. Mm -hmm. Quantum computers are literally quantum systems. If you have high control of them, you can just model the molecule you're interested in by building up you know, some quantum computer that mimics the action of the molecule. And then you measure it, you get information out of it, you understand how it works. And as far as we know, this is probably the only way to even understand how these larger systems work. So yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, we got it. Okay. We got it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, well, we, we'll have more questions hopefully after the break. Uh, thank you. Thank you.